Okay, good morning, everybody. It looks like we're starting to level off with our number of attendees, so uh, I guess we will get started. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Please note that this presentation is being recorded. My name is Christine O'Neill, and I'm an environmental planner with the Naugatuck Valley Council of Governments, or NVCOG. For those who are unfamiliar, NVCOG supports 19 communities in West Central Connecticut with activities related to transportation, environment, land use, brownfields, GIS, and more. We've opened today's trainings to stakeholders throughout to, uh, Connecticut, so we're gladly welcoming anyone who is here both from the Naugatuck Valley and beyond the Valley. Couple of quick housekeeping notes. Um, if you have a question during the presentation, we'll just ask you to write it in the chat. Uh, questions will be addressed at the end. We're leaving plenty of time for that. The training should run about an hour and we'll have uh, plenty of time for the Q&A with our experts. If you are here to receive OEDM credit, please note that all participants will receive a certificate of attendance that can be turned in to the Office of Education and Data Management for one credit hour. Please change your name on the Zoom if it does not accurately reflect your name. Um, and we will make sure that that is, um, uh, Desiree, I just wanna check with you or Rich, they have the ability to change their names, right? Yes. Yep, okay, great. So yeah, please you know, right click on your name and change it uh, so that we make sure we accurately capture your name in the certificate of attendance. Uh, with that, I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers, Sirtach, Jeffrey, and Omaris. Sirtach Akar joined the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL, in 2014, and since then has been working as an energy analyst and system engineer in distributed systems and storage group of the Accelerated Deployment and Decision Support Center. He has over 19 years of professional experience in geothermal and solar energy product development, hybrid renewable energy systems modeling, techno-economic analysis, manufacturing cost modeling, and global market and supply chain analysis. Jeffrey Cook is the sub-program manager for solar analysis at the National Renewable Energy Lab and program lead for the Solar Automated Permit Processing Plus platform. He has also been on the staff at NREL since 2014 and focuses on solar, photovoltaics, permitting, resilience, technology cost reduction, and distributed energy resource aggregation. So we have a couple of rocket scientists with us. We are very lucky today. Um, we are also really pleased to welcome Connecticut State Building Inspector Omaris Vasquez to today's training. She will be available to chime in with Connecticut specific facts and answer Connecticut specific questions after the presentation. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Danny Falk from SoulSmart to uh, talk about our partner organization. Great, thank you so much, Christine. Um, as Christine was mentioning, um, I'm uh, Danny Falk with the SoulSmart program. I'm a program manager um, on uh, the SoulSmart program. Uh, I specifically work with the Interstate Renewable Energy Council, but primarily work on um, SoulSmart in technical assistance, uh, designation, recruitment, um, and uh, a whole bunch of different uh, things on the SoulSmart program. So ha happy to see the uh, great attendance today, and I'll get right into some information on SoulSmart before we uh, get into the, the meat and potatoes, so to speak, of uh, solar inspection. Um, so just a little bit of information um, uh, and an acknowledgement disclaimer here that um, we are, um, uh, SoulSmart is a U.S. Uh, Department of Energy program um, under an award from uh, the DOE in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Um, and this is just a disclaimer to say that um, this was uh, prepared as part of the um, United States government um, and, uh, you know, doesn't assume any legal liability over uh, anything in this presentation. Um, so with that large disclaimer out of the way, I'll get into a little bit on uh, the SoulSmart program. Um, and its importance. Um, and as uh, many people on the call um, probably would attest to, uh, local government action is really an important part of developing solar projects um, and getting solar off the ground. Um, there have been uh, some recent estimates that up to 65% of the cost of a solar PV system is not related to the hardware, hardware of that system. Um, so we call uh, the non-hardware cost soft costs and that's primarily what SoulSmart works in, these uh, soft costs. And thankfully, um, 
you know, being able to uh, improve the actions around soft costs can reduce that 65% of the cost substantially for solar projects. That can be anything from uh, streamlining permitting inspections, uh, supporting consumer education, leading by example, uh, getting involved with finance um, on, a, on a community level, group purchasing, um, as well as many other options. Uh, so a lot of these options can help reduce those soft costs, which is SoulSmart's uh, focus. So a little bit on the SoulSmart program, um, what is it and uh, what is it focused on? We're a national designation program that operates at the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, we've helped over 450 local governments um, with their soft costs and improving uh, solar uh, development processes within a community, making it more efficient and uh, more cost effective. Um, and we do that by providing communities that take uh, a number of best practices uh, in solar and awarding them a designation signifying that they have implemented the best practices in solar. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of different categories uh, that we focus on, permitting inspection, planning and zoning, um, uh, community engagement, uh, government operations, uh, the whole nine yards, pretty much everything, as mentioned, that isn't related to the software. Um, and that designation shows that communities have, have worked in those areas and made it easier to, um, to uh, get solar within their... Uh, within their jurisdiction. Um, within Connecticut, we have uh, several SoulSmart uh, designees, 15 um, to be exact. Uh, we've got four gold, uh, and you can see the communities right there, uh, five silver designees, and then six bronze designees, including uh, most notably uh, NV Cog, who was uh, great enough to uh, pr uh, put on this presentation on solar inspection. Uh, so they they themselves have uh, done a lot of work um, with the Soul Smart program, and they've been uh, fantastic to work with. Um, and I should mention, if anyone is interested um, in getting their community Soul Smart uh, technical assistance or designation, um, we will be uh, I'll be available for any questions. You can also check out our website, which I'll go into a little bit at the end of this call. Um, but as you can see, a lot of communities in C Connecticut have uh, been Soul Smart designated. So SoulSmart's role in solar development um, is mainly focused, again, on, uh, you know, taking action to remove those barriers to solar energy growth. And we do that pro by providing technical assistance toward a SoulSmart designation. Um, you know, this can mean a lot of different things. It can mean um, doing a zoning review of uh, a local government zoning ordinance, just to say, um, are there any barriers? Are there any things that are unclear um, that a community might want to look at? Um, it can be helping a community develop a solar permitting checklist um, where you can, where a person looking at the website, a local government website, can go on and just look at that permitting checklist and say, here's what I need in terms of permits with this community if I want to, you know, get solar on my house or look at a solar development. Um, so we provide that technical assistance to um, members of a local government to help with those processes, uh, whatever those processes are for a community. Um, we're also committed to providing equitable opportunities for underserved communities under uh, the Justice 40 program. Um, and, uh, you know, it, there's a wide variety of things we can help with, but we're mostly focused on those non-hardware costs. So, you know, costs not related to the panels, the inverters, th things like that um, with solar projects. Uh, we mentioned a little bit on the categories, um, but, you know, permitting inspection, planning and zoning, community engagement, market development, um, and uh, other topics as well um, are some of our areas of focus in SoulSmart. Um, we have four different uh, SoulSmart uh, designation levels, uh, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum, which is new in 2023. Um, and by achieving these different uh, designation levels, communities can show that they have simplified those um, soft costs related uh, solar processes, um, which helps developers, members of community really really see that a local government is um, open for solar business, as we like to say. So how can a community enroll in SoulSmart if they're interested? Um, you can always feel free to reach out to me. Um, I think my information will be available. Um, but you can also check out our SoulSmart website. 
Um, and you can see the uh, Join Soul Smart button right there on our homepage, and you can request a consultation call. And we'd be happy to talk with any uh, local government or county government or regional organization that is interested in getting designated on whatever topics you want to talk about on solar and a little bit more on how the program uh, works and how we can assist local governments. Um, so that's the that's the uh, the short breakdown of the Soul Smart program. Uh, happy to talk to any local governments that that are looking for other processes outside of just inspection, which we'll go over on this call. And um, we're happy to help at Soul Smart. And I should say, all this technical assistance is available at no cost to a uh, an, an interested community. So, um, you know, consultation calls free. So we're happy to speak to any local governments that are interested in learning about other processes outside of inspection to help their uh, solar development. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll throw it back to Christine um, for the, uh, the meat and potatoes on uh, solar inspection. That's great. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, Danny, I just ask if you don't mind to put into the chat for everyone the Soul Smart website so they could just click on over there if they're interested. And uh, I know what you've all been waiting for is uh, the that good solar inspection stuff. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sir Tatch and uh, Jeffrey and uh, Omeris, and we'll get started. Right. Thanks, Christine. Uh, this is Sir Tatch Akar from National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So let me start sharing uh, my slides. Oh, wait. Okay. So this is the introduction to residential rooftop PV field inspections training. Uh, my name is Sarta Jakar. Uh, I'm an energy analyst from National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Uh, today, Jeff Cook and I will be presenting this training session. Um, this training was developed by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory for the ICMA Soul Smart program and designed to provide code officials uh, with information about key oversight responsibilities related to the field inspection of residential rooftop solar PV systems. In this training, we will cover topics related to uh, how field inspections occur, how to prepare for field inspection, uh, performing the field inspection, and go into more depth for how the, to inspect different and more common uh, photovoltaic systems uh, related to best practices. And NREL is the National Laboratory of US Department of Energy, Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. NREL is continuing to support the goals of SolSmart to foster proliferation of permitting and inspection best practices that can improve safety while growing strong local solar markets by reducing soft cost. Today, we're going to cover uh, the field inspection for residential distributed rooftop PV systems, and some additional inspection processes are required for the energy storage systems uh, added to the PV installations. We will discuss the energy storage systems briefly in this training, but these systems are quite complex, so you may need more training on that. And uh, finally, multifamily uh, or commercial applications, ground-mounted systems, and many energy storage applications are outside the scope of this training. So having said that, uh, the first step is the field inspection overview. Uh, let's take a look at the overview uh, inspection um, actually is the last line of defense to enforce public health and safety. Perfect plan does not always equal to perfect installation. Uh, that means many projects uh, fail the inspection. And the NREL data shows that on average 24% fail in 12 authorities having jurisdiction. And 58% uh, of those are identified as re related to the work quality issue, meaning that the system was not installed per the code. And this figure shows the percent rates of failures by the uh, authorities having jurisdiction for both traditional and solar app uh, inspections. So uh, how are the inspections done today? So inspections can be scheduled in person over the phone or combination of all. 
Inspections can be planned within two-hour window, half-day window, or full window, or an uncertain window based on the complexity and difficulty of the system to be inspected. How inspections are able to be scheduled by the community can influence the cost of the installation. For example, if a staff person must be there all day and the inspector doesn't end up making it on the, to the site, uh, that, that adds up 80 hours and that's a, a loss of productivity. Uh, and this is reducing this, uh, and this is actually increasing the cost of uh, inspection. By reducing scheduling windows, communities can have a potential impact on uh, inspection costs. So how are how were inspections done before the pandemic and after the pandemic? Most field inspections were conducted in person prior to COVID-19 pandemic. During the pandemic, alternative inspection options such as virtual can be FaceTime or Skype, uh, photo inspections or third-party inspection grew, but in-person inspections remain as, as most common. The number of virtual and photo inspections uh, reduced after the pandemic, but remained as an alternative option in many communities, suggesting that these options will be successfully implemented in these communities and they might grow in uh, the post-pandemic future. The type of inspection can also have impact on the cost of the system, especially in the event you require contractors to be on site. So the first step is uh, to prepare for the inspection. Who and what is needed to carry out an inspection? Actually, uh, some require a representative from the installer and some require that the representative to be an electrician. Uh, here's another pathway uh, which the inspection process can influence soft costs as requiring an electrician at the time of inspection, but you only offer a day-long window uh, that could be quite expensive. So what is needed to perform an inspection also varies by the authorities having jurisdiction. Uh, plans might include single or three-line diagrams, site layouts, spec sheets, insulation manuals, load, structural, electrical calculations, or photos. Some require just an access and a letter. Uh, some don't even require a letter and don't go even up to the roof. Um, so the inspection processes are modified if community adopts Solar App Plus, which is the platinum designation. The Solar App Plus inspection checklist covers everything that must be inspected and the instructor should verify on, on the field. Uh, this also helps the inspectors without expert knowledge in solar to understand what is needed to be inspected and how. Solar App Plus has also been correl correlated with better inspection rates, which could be because contractors can check their install before the inspection to ensure it is code compiled per the checklist. I may chime in really quick, uh, Sir Taj. Just wanted to elaborate a little bit on the electrical contractor, this has been one of those um, questions that have come up often. In Connecticut, uh, the licensure requirements for tradespersons on, on installations are regulated by DCP, as most officials here know. And the code is not very specific on, there's no requirement per se in Connecticut, uh, at least from the NEC or from the building code standpoint to require an electrical uh, contractor to be on site during inspections. Um, utility companies, obviously, if you're doing the tie-in, might require something specific because they do require sometimes to have the electrical contractor there, but it's not a code requirement. I just wanted to elaborate that. Um, access must be provided, and that's essentially what it is. So it's just informing the owners that, at least for residential construction, because I know commercial usually is a lot easier, um, you have those trades persons there and it's a little bit of a different animal but for residential projects where um, it is regulated by DCP as long as there's access to the panel or access to the equipment is already available that's pretty much the minimum requirement and it's just a little bit of a gray area I wanted to clarify there for everyone. Thanks. After this uh, uh, additional info, um, I will continue with the uh, performing field inspection section. 
Um, so in this section, the, the key challenge for inspectors is the time constraint and the number of inspections that must be performed within the given time frame. The inspectors must use their discretion in the field and adjust their processes based on the local characteristics of the community and the contractor community. Uh, having said that, uh, there are actually common types of code violations, especially when time is constra constrained. Uh, these are the key uh, things to check. So before starting the inspection, the inspector should ensure, first of all, they should ensure the system is not energized. The best place is to start the inspection from the solar array and electrical path can be followed to the grid point. During, during that inspection, uh, the inspector should look at the most common and most serious code violations. If time is very limited, the inspector can focus on the inverter array, the grid connection, junction boxes, uh, which are the most common code violations uh, are. So uh, also there are uh, inspection checklists, which are actually uh, uh, a key resource for inspectors to carry out their enforcement obligations, especially when the inspector is not very familiar with solar. Many entities have created checklists to inform solar inspections, such as the Solar App Plus, uh, SolSmart, and the uh, EERE CERC, um, uh, IREC uh, has very organized inspection checklist. So even so, these checklists are no replacement for having the knowledge of code enforced in each community. Every inspector should have a strong knowledge of relevant code requirements associated with the solar projects. So what are the key elements in these checklists? So despite the varying checklists, they have most of the most commonly, they have same key elements relating to wiring management, which includes conductors, conduit, raceway, cable assembly, connectors, uh, and, and PV modules, racking, inverter, point of utility interconnection, uh, then grounding, overcurrent protection and disconnects, uh, the rapid uh, shutdown system, uh, and of course, signs and labels. Uh, so in this training, actually, we will uh, follow the IREX uh, inspection checklist to guide our discussion of key elements to review across each of each of these uh, uh, different components. So the first of these uh, long list, th this long list is uh, wiring management. So in this section, we will cover the inspection requirements and the related code for each inspection step can be found and the, the each inspection step that needs to be followed and the related code uh, can be seen in these tables related to that inspection step. So inspectors should verify that the bonding fittings are used for ferrous metal conduits enclosing grounding electro electrode conductors and concentric or eccentric knockouts with metal conduits for circuit over 250 volts to the ground. If ambient temperature exceeds uh, 30 degrees Celsius, conductor ampicities should have be, should be corrected for higher temperatures. And PV source and output circuits must be separated from non-PV system, circuit conductors and inverters output, uh, circuit and the circuit conductors. So DC positive and negative conductors should not be identified with white or gray, except solidly grounded PV system conductors. Single conductors cables must be secured within the 12 inches of each box, cabinet, conduit body, or other termination. So these are actually a couple of uh, uh, photographs or images uh, showing some violations, code violations related to uh, conductors and wiring management. So uh, continuing for the contract conductors, the PV systems, uh, PV system conductors shall be grouped and identified uh, and single conductors cables must be secured by staples, cable tires, straps or hangers or similar fittings at intervals which do not exceed uh, 4.5 feet. So export, exposed single conductor wiring must be at a 90 degrees Celsius, it's at wet rated, sunlight resistant type uh, and listed PV wire. 
uh, the DC conductors inside the building must be in a metal raceway or a metal clad cable. And a properly sized equipment grounding conductor must be routed with the circuit conductors. So you can see the, I think the, the junction box and some uh, conductors uh, in this picture. Uh, other uh, components which needs wiring management are conduit raceways and uh, other cables. Uh, terminals containing more than one conductor must be listed for multiple conductors. DC wiring in buildings is installed in metallic conductor or raceway and conduit, con the conduit must run between the subarray and the DC combiner boxes. Expansion fittings must be installed uh, where necessary to compensate the thermal expansion, deflection, and contraction. Uh, if you take a look at the connectors, uh, connectors and terminals used for fine strand uh, conductors must be listed for use with such conductors. Crimps on terminals must be listed and installed uh, using a listed tool specified for use in crimping those specific crimps. Pressure terminals must be listed for environment and Thailand uh, to manufacturers recommended torque specifications. Uh, and connectors must be listed for voltage uh, of the system and have appropriate temperature and ampere ratings. And that's all about the, the wiring. Uh, the next thing to check is the module. And this thing also includes the racking and the, the inverter equipment. Let's start with the modules. Um, for the modules, the inspector should verify that the module, ma module manufacturer make, model, and number of modules matches the approved plan. And modules must be properly marked and labeled, and module connectors must be tight and secure. And the inspector should verify that the modules are grounded and bounded in accordance with manufacturer's installation instructions. If the racking system is used to bond the modules, the module or rack assembly is listed to bond bonding attribute of UL2703 standards. And PV circuits locations must be clearly marked. Next thing is racking. Um, so uh, in uh, the inspect in racking, the inspectors should verify that the roof penetrations are flashed to prevent moisture from entering the, the roof. And racking and PV system support structures installed and torqued per manufacturer's instructions, which is the same type of inspection like the PV modules. And uh, so the racking is actually linked to the, uh, the, the PV module. And next thing to check is actually the inverter. Uh, and this inverter, uh, in this picture, you're seeing a string type of inverter, but inverter can also be a micro inverter that can be on the rooftop. Uh, so based on that, uh, uh, the inspection process uh, continues inspection of the, 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 the in in inverter based on its type. The first thing uh, is um, the inspector should verify that the inverter is properly secured with the manufacturer's required clearances and check that the AC and DC terminations are properly torqued. Second, the inspector should verify that the inverter provides DC ground fault protection and DC arc fault protection where PV systems operate over 80 volts. Last, labels should be per signage requirements uh, as, as they are uh, listed. So, Next thing to check is point of connection, then the rapid rapid shut, shutdown device, uh, and also grounding uh, and labeling. To start with the point of utility interconnection, uh, the point of connection should be either on the supply side of the service, disconnecting means, or at a dedicated breaker, or disconnect on the load side of the service, disconnecting means. The total rating of the overcorrect overcurrent protection device OCPD uh, supplying a panel board uh, plus 125 percent of the inverter output current that should not exceed the 100 
20% of the rating of the panel board bus, bus bars. And the overcurrent protection for supply side connected to the power source must be provided within three meters, which is 10 feet uh, of the point of interconnection to the service. In this picture, you are seeing an example of a failure uh, from a line side tab failure. Uh, and the, the, this is the this is showing the significance of uh, how the inspections should be done properly uh, to prevent ending up with these kind of uh, failures in the in the system. Next thing is the rapid shutdown. Uh, the inspector should check the rapid shutdown initiation device installed and located per approved plan. The dwellings must the dwellings device must be outside a readily accessible location. Installed rapid shutdown equipment must be listed for the application within the limits of NEC uh, 690.12b. And also the labels, uh, labels should be per signage requirements table installed. And when we come to grounding uh, and over current protection disconnects, uh, the inspector should check that the connection from PV systems so the grounding electrode must uh, is is made per approved plans, and the OPDCs are listed for use in PV systems and ratings. They match that they match the approved plan, and disconnects used in the PV systems uh, must be rated for the maximum circuit current and voltage. Uh, isolating devices or disconnects must be installed for PV equipment, either integrating into the equipment within the ten feet of equipment. Or within, or within the 10 feet of equipment. And uh, connectors that are readily accessible and operating over 30 volts DC or 15 volts AC require a tool for opening. And PV source and output circuits in readily accessible locations and operating over 30 volts must be guarded or in a raceway. The upper photo here shows an, a DC disconnect uh, next to the inverter, but the AC disconnect uh, are outside. So this is not a uh, that not correct installation. And the lower photo shows both AC and DC disconnects are on uh, on the side of the inverter, and which is the right way of uh, installing it. Last thing to check is actually uh, signs and labels. So we are not going to go into details of every label. But uh, the labels and signs should have suitable font sizes, words and colors and location and visible uh, from a distance. Uh, and the label shall be sufficient, should have a sufficient durability to withstand the environment involved, such as if adhesives are using, if you use, if they use adhesives, uh, uh, they should be uh, water resistant. Uh, and the colors should be uh, bright and visible. Um, so these are the main things to check. And there's a uh, in the checklist you can find the proper labeling, uh, and uh, that's uh, how they are going to be attached or stick to the uh, related component or device. So having said that, this takes me to a group exercise, and uh, I would like to. Uh, invite Jeff uh, for this. Uh, Jeff will uh, go through the, uh, the first group exercise. Jeff? Yeah, you should uh, be able to hear me. So uh, thanks, Sertouch, for passing over to me. Um, and so we're going to take a little bit of a break here to try and engage with the audience a little bit um, from kind of giving Sertouch a little bit of a pause and for you all to um, Speak with us a little bit about what you've learned so far. Um, and so if folks are willing to either use the chat or come off mute, we'd like you to work with us to answer this first question. Um, um, can so I do a quick note, Jeff? So um, sure. I don't believe anyone is able to come off mute just because of the format for the webinar, but we had some issues with the chat. The chat is now enabled. So uh, okay. if you wanna answer, please put it in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. So uh, yeah, folks, if you can open up your chat box, it's that little um, icon with the um, like the talking bubble. 
Um, and so if you can click on that chat box, which is also next to in my screen, the participants uh, list and share screen. And so I already just saw someone put a question in there. So um, you should be able to respond. So again, based on what Search Hutch has just discussed, we're looking for everyone in the audience to let us know which locations have the most common and most serious code violations. I'll give you a second to think about that question. And then go ahead and put your answers into the chat. We already got, um, yeah, we're getting some, great. So uh, I'm gonna, if you keep putting some in there, I'd love to keep seeing what, you're, what you put in because in reality, uh, the issues that you see often relate to your local characteristics or your local contractor, because not all contractors are the same nationwide. So uh, based on where you are and your geography, you can have different issues. Uh, but there are some common ones, um, and I'm already seeing some of those in the chat. A lot of them relate to wire management. A lot of them relate to how they're connecting at the main panel. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of issues with line side taps, which makes a lot of sense because, again, based on where you are and what your what main panels look like in your area, you can have different types of connection methods, especially the older the panel, uh, the more likely you are to have uh, different or less common connection pathways that aren't just the 120% rule. Um, so wire management, conduit fill are big issues. Uh, we see issues, of course, at junction boxes and on the array, meaning that you're not seeing uh, appropriate uh, attachments or you're not seeing the wires uh, run cleanly, et cetera. So uh, I'm really liking what we're seeing in the chat on those. Uh, you can move forward to attach to the, to the, the answer part of it. Yeah, so here's a couple of examples, um, but yeah, I'm seeing equipment not being listed, um, you know, panels that are being, sorry. <coughs> Um, panels that are overloaded, et cetera. There are all sorts of things that you can see and you'll see out in the field. And we can move to the next one, Sir Touch. Um, and now, new question, of course, you can keep putting stuff in the chat for issues you see, but question number two, what should be the minimum working clearance for all components that require service? So this can be the inverter, this can be the main panel, this can be batteries. Um, any equipment that requires service. And yep, we're seeing 36 inches, three feet. That is what's required out there in the field. Um, and that's what you see here. Now in this diagram, you're also seeing setbacks. So Amaris, I'd love for you to just kind of chime in a little bit on setbacks. They'll come back around, but this is a nice diagram, I think, to talk about it. Yeah, of course, um, with Connecticut, as everybody here might be already aware, but to, we're so smart guys. Um, we do have, uh, with the new IRC code, we have some amendments that are Connecticut specific, just so that we can um, have some alternatives for access to the roof for proper fire venting in case of an event of a fire. Um, generally, the, the two pathways from the lower edge of the roof up to the high point of the roof is required. Now there are um, specifics and at least one of them, of course, as this diagram shows, has to be from the main street or from access to a driveway. There are exceptions that we allow here where if they are installing the photovoltaic arrays completely only on one side of the roof and it is not over I believe it's a uh, thirty-three um, percent. Then usually you can be allowed to have an eighteen-inch setback at the ridge. But if you're going over that sixty-six percent, then you need a three feet on either side. Now the pathways um, where we are installing the arrays completely on one side of the roof, we do have exemptions where you don't have to have that pathway from the lowest edge of your roof line up to the peak. Um, so if it is installed completely on one side, then you can essentially uh, only have uh, the one access. But there are um, 
there's a little bit of a typo and I wanted to make that clear at this presentation in our current code where the exceptions refer to six, uh, 324.6.3, it really should be referring to uh, 324.6.4. So in essence, you have to follow the main uh, two pathways on the main 6.1 pathway section. But if you do follow any of the three exceptions for uh, ridges, valleys, um, and hipped roofs, then at least one of those pathways for the roof access points cannot be located over an opening. So over a garage door, over a main entrance, or over a window. And that's essentially just to maintain at least one pathway for firefighters to access without the risk of fire going through that opening and inhibiting their access up to the roof. Thanks so much, Amaris. And so sort of let's move to the next question. Um, to get us back on track, I'm going to more or less um, skip those questions. Uh, but if you could put the answer up, Sir Chach, I'm going to talk about it briefly just so folks are aware because um, we've got a lot of content to go through today. Um, so can you put that picture up there, Sir Chach? But ultimately here what we're looking at is you're, you're trying not to overload the, sorry, <coughs> the circuit certainly, um, and you can't have um, your max current exceeding 120% of the inverter output. Um, and then similarly, when you're talking about a maximum allowable current for the OCPD, you're looking at 120% of the bus bar rating on both of those things. Um, so that's important uh, to be able to check and that can be done at, at plan review also. So you just did an inspection have to verify that the OCPD that they installed matches the plan, but you can also double check that out in inspection. Uh, so let's move to the last question. Um, and this one, I, we wanted to get a sense of what kind of violations people are seeing on this uh, on these three pictures. So I'd love for folks, you can just say, you know, 4A, the violation I see is X, or 4B is, is Y, 4C um, is Z. So we'll give you a second to take a look and process these uh, three images and go ahead and put in the chat the um, issues you see with each one of these images. And we're getting some responses for 4C and 4A. Perfect. We're getting some for 4B. I'm liking some of those comments in there. And in fact, in, in 4C, yeah, it's actually in that one, you can move to the answers now, Sir Touch. In that one, it's actually poor flashing. But if, yeah, if it was a vent, because um, it also kind of looks like a vent, uh, that would, of course, be an, a code violation as well. Um, so yeah, in 4B, we're seeing wire management issues. They're not secured and they're not. Um, clean and orderly, um, and then you've got a horizontal connect up disconnect instead of vertical mounting. So yeah, some, clearly some issues there, um, there are lots of issues in these. And so I think, well, we'll go to the next one, but ultimately this is what inspectors out in the field, you'll see stuff like this all the time. And so there are a lot of blatant violations, which just reflects the importance of inspectors out in the field. Um, so Sirtaj, I believe I'll be passing back to you. You're muted, Sir Touch. Oh, I'm muted. Thank, thanks, Jeff. Uh, that was good to cover that uh, group session. Uh, and I'm I just followed the chat box for the answers, and we got good feedback, good response. Thank you all. Uh, so uh, from now on, we will just continue with some um, examples, and um, I will just describe two different systems: one with a microinverter system. And the other one is the string inverter system. Uh, there are like some key differences. We will just see how the inspection should be in two different systems with a microinverter or a string type of inverter. The first one is the microinverter system. So the microinverter PV systems convert DC to AC right after the module uh, via, via the inverter lock located at the rooftop. So when the inspector starts the inspection, the first thing to inspect uh, is the rooftop array, then the inverter, 
Uh, and since the inverter is at the rooftop uh, at the, in microinverter systems, uh, so the PV modules uh, must be, uh, first of all, listed uh, to the UL1703 and the microinverters must be listed to the UL1741. So that's the first thing to check the listing, the um, uh, proper listing of uh, equipment. Uh, and PV modules, uh, and after, after the PV modules, the, uh, the array conductors must not touch the roof surface and they should be properly secured and supported. Uh, like we have seen in the example in group exercise, uh, we should, we, there, there shouldn't be any cable unsupported or unsecured. Uh, conductors that touch the roof are subject to damage and cause system failures or arcing fires. And conductors that, I mean, they must be uh, protected from prolonged exposure and must have the proper band radius, not, not strained. Um, and the microinverters must be attached to the racking system with torque values specified by the manufacturer. The rooftop attachments must be securely mounted to the structure ele structural elements, structural members uh, with proper weather sealing. So uh, after completing the rooftop array, the inspection must continue with the conduit and junction box. The conductor type and connections in a rooftop junction box and a conduit must be listed for wet locations. Location of the PV system disconnects must match the plan. Uh, there's, no need, there's no need for labeling the AC conduits because uh, only DC uh, conduits uh, are labeled. Uh, some utilities, utility companies may require an external AC disconnect for visible activation. In that case, the rapid uh, shutdown label must be installed per plan. Um, and a system equipped with that rapid shutdown uh, means that the, the controlled contract conductors shall be limited to not more than uh, 30 volts and 200 volt amperes within 10 seconds of rapid sh shutdown initiation. So continuing with the uh, inspection, next thing is to inspect the main service panel board. Um, so the, um, the main service panel board uh, is the last major item to be inspected. Uh, and the microinverter system uh, is the main uh, and microinverter system is the main service board and meter are uh, can be uh, in this picture you can see the meter and the main service board. <clears throat> the inspector must verify the the bus size uh, of point of utility connection, main circuit breaker and inverter conduit breakers must match the plan. Uh, the sum of ampere ratings and device supplying power to the bus board, bus bar or the conductor shall not exceed the 120% of the rating of the bus bar or conductor like we have described in the example uh, in the group session. And the inspector must also verify additional equipment, uh, grounding conductors, conductor follow the cable path, racking system and module combination for bonding, grounding, and fire resistant rating, wire management, and proper labeling. So that's basically uh, the things that is uh, covered in a microinverter system. The next system is actually actually is a string inverter system, which is slightly different than the microinverter system. Uh, so in string inverters, PV in P inverter PV systems, the PV module generates DC, and the conduit carries DC to the inverter. String inverters are mostly located in ground level in the residential applications. So the main thing to check at rooftop array are module and attachments, uh, the junction box, and also, of course, the wiring management. All rooftop attachments, including junction boxes, must be properly better sealed. The DC-DC converters must be properly attached to the mounting structure, and the modules must be attached to the racking system with torque values specified by the manufacturers as described in other previous slides, uh, the uh, the torque values uh, definitely uh, needs to be checked by the manufacturer's uh, spec sheets. 
Uh, and then uh, next thing to check in the string inverter system is the conduit and the, of course, the inverter itself. Uh, the conduit must be properly labeled in every 10 feet and adequately supported in every six feet intervals. So uh, we described this in the microinverter system. There was no labeling uh, in conduits, uh, but in a DC carrying conduit, labeling is required. And of course, the supports uh, are important. Uh, the conduit boxes that are part of the DC circuit must be correctly labeled for identification. Uh, inver inverters must be installed at proper orientation, mounting, and labeling. Uh, in some cases, utility requires an external accessible AC disconnect. In that case, the inspector must ver verify that the label shows AC operating voltage max AC, cur AC current. So uh, the final thing to check in the string inverter system uh, is a final things to check are the sub panel, the grounding conductor and type, uh, overcurrent, overcurrent, overcurrent protection and the main meter. The sub panel is connected to the AC disconnect and once the AC disconnect is operated, each DC-DC converter is limited to one volt. So NEC requires there is an AC disconnect means AC disconnect means, but the number of disconnects depends on the, the product in the system and the utility requirements. So the inspector should verify the size of the bus bar versus the output of the inverter and check that there is a there's discontinuity within the grounding system. So there is no difference potential. So last thing to check is the main meter. So the bidirectional meter must be located near the string inverter and must be sealed for weather conditions. So that covers the, the those two examples, but what if the project has a battery storage? So if the system has a lithium ion energy storage system, there are some additional concerns and inspection steps. So the electrical structure of a PV system with a lithium ion energy storage system is far more complex than a standalone PV system, which means additional consideration and inspection processes are needed. Additional inspection is required for individual battery capacity rating, aggregate capacity ratings by installation location and heat detection. Aggregate capacity rating for the energy storage system installed within the utility closets, basement, uh, storage or the utility should be at 40 kilowatt hour. Uh, but if it is in, in an attached or detached garage or uh, detached accessory structures, exter exterior walls or outdoors uh, or on the ground, uh, it can be up to, it can be 80 kilowatt hour. So the inspector must also check access pathways in and out of the dwellings and uh, verify that the structure elements follow the seismic design requirements for their category. For example, in California, uh, the seismic category D or greater is required uh, for uh, structural design considerations. So what are other additional inspection steps for uh, energy storage system? Uh, flexible battery cables must have must leave the battery enclosure. Flexible fine strand strand cables must be used with terminals, logs, de devices, and connectors that are listed and marked for that such use. Uh, area must be well ventilated. That's an important thing. Uh, the batteries uh, and the batteries are not installed in living areas. Uh, live parts of the battery systems must be guarded to prevent accidental accidental contact by person or object objects, and work, working space and illumination must be provided around the battery installation. Uh, proper diagrams and place placards must be provided in the building. Electric service equipment and other power and uh, for the electric service equipment and other power locations. So. These are the additional uh, steps that needs to be taken care during the uh, the, in, the inspection of energy storage systems. 
Actually, that brings us to a, a second group exercise. Uh, if we add something, start touch. If you sure. have a moment on this, because we do get a lot of questions in the state about um, the enclosures. So, so in in the IRC, at least for residential construction, these are allowed to be in the garage. Uh, attached garages, as long as they're separated appropriately, according to the garage separations, including like door closers, that's for garages. Elsewhere in the basement, I uh, just wanted to clarify that it does have to have some kind of a finish. Uh, we get often occasionally some mods where they want to install these ESS uh, storage systems in an unfinished basement, and that is not that is not uh, appropriate. It does need to be separated. It doesn't have to be fire rated, but it does have to have at least some kind of a finish or gypsum separation. Uh, the doors do not need to be rated either. We get those questions a lot. It just needs to be a solid door uh, for like, a, say you had a closet in, in a, a living space or something. It just can't be in a bedroom, et cetera. So I just wanna make that clarification. There's this assumption that it needs to be in a fire rated enclosure. It, it doesn't just have to be separated. Yeah, and if we talk about that too, there's there's also the, how much separation. So it's typically three feet unless a jurisdiction accepts uh, large scale fire testing as, as allowable under UL 9540A that could allow closer spacing, but that's a jurisdictional decision. Um, there were a couple of references in the chat to folks. Uh, yes, we are referencing a lot of the NEC 2017 code in here, uh, but in reality, a lot of the code in NEC 2017 actually appears in NEC 2020, but the code references are different. So um, our apologies that this is referencing 2017, um, and, uh, but in reality, like I said, most of the, all of the code that we're discussing here um, does show back up in 2020, but those code references are different. Um, so let's move forward. Of course, there are a few things that have changed in the 2020 NEC, particularly relative to storage. But when we talk about storage, we're talking about um, what's applicable um, in 2020. All right, so folks, if you can find those chat boxes again, the first question is, what should you look for on a PV module label when you're out on site? Um, so if people could throw into the chat what you what you look for on that label, because there's a lot of good information that you can find there um, that's important. So I'll give folks a chance to put that information into the chat. I saw a couple answers, but there's a couple more things that can be found on that label. So I'm going to let people keep chiming in there. One of the more obvious things, of course, is to make sure that the model number is what was actually on the plan um, and that the manufacturer is the same because you often see contractors changing out modules. And that's been pretty common uh, with the supply chain issues that have existed. So they may have gotten a plan approved for a project that or for a, a different module and then they installed something else but never got a plan review of that, so that's important. And on top of everything else that's in there, so listings are really important. Um, that was flagged. Fire classification rating, of course, is important, as well as as well as capacity, et cetera. So yeah, thanks your touch for helping flag some of those things here. So all of that matters, and you can actually get quite a bit too um, if you're doing plan review out in the field for getting short circuit current and making sure you're not overloading the circuit, but that's getting pretty deep into it. Uh, but you can do that with the with the label as as folks are are pulling out there. So uh, I think we can move to the next one. All right, and now this is important, of course, for uh, conduit. So at what length and interval does the DC conduit need to be labeled and supported? And then you can also answer to be if you'd like to AC conduits also need labeling. So what's the length and interval? give people a chance to answer that. Awesome, yeah, we're getting some good feedback here and it's all, yeah, accurate. So we're looking for the 10 foot and six foot as people are pointing out, so you support six, you label at 10. Um, and then it's not required, labeling's not required for DC conduit. Um, Great. 
All right, let's move on to the next one. All right, we were just talking about batteries in the basement. Uh, what would be the aggregate capacity rating for lithium ion batteries in the basement? Now, your understanding, of course, that you can only have that max sorry, <coughs> of, of individual batteries, of course, but what can be the aggregate capacity in the aggregate capacity we're looking for in the basement? Yeah, so we had a couple of kind of, uh, uh, we had some saying 80, some 20, a lot of 40s, and it is 40. The important thing, uh, thinking about you can have an individual battery up to 20 kWh, and then you can have uh, two of those if they were both 20 kWh to get to 40. Um, 80 you could do elsewhere, but certainly not in the basement. So this is a trick Where's question you too. Yeah, this is a trick question. So while 40 is the limit, you can go higher as long as you install it according to the fire code. So exactly. did you adopt the 2021, uh, currently we adopted 2021 IRC. So that's kind of a little bit of an exception in a sense. Um, so yeah, while it is capped out at 40 for within a basement, uh, as long as it has, the fire code has these additional separation requirements and ratings and all that stuff and the ventilation and all that to, to help mitigate the fact that you're installing a much larger system in, in homes. That's exactly right. And so when you think about it too, you're, um, if anything in the basement is over 40 kW, that's a big red flag to say, okay, well, what are the fire code requirements here? Were they actually adhered to? And do I see that in the plan uh, that was approved? Um, so, cause they might say, oh, well, you know, we can do this per the fire code, but then you gotta say, well, you didn't actually get that approved per your plan. So then that's a fail too, or I mean, you. You know, as an inspector, you have discretion, but you could fail that uh, based on what you see out there. Awesome. Okay. Uh, then I think this is our last question, if memory serves. And I think we have time to do this one, so let's go for it. All right. So you're out on site, and you have a bus bar rating of 200 amps. What is the maximum allowable contribution from the PV system out there? So you got 200 amps. How much can you have on the PV side for its contribution at that panel? Awesome. Yeah, I'm going to uh, chime in a little bit to this because we are seeing that. Yeah, it's 40 amps because you're looking at 120% of its bus bar rating. So if you've got a 200 amp panel, uh, that puts you at 240 when you can go up to 120%. So then you got to track the bus bar load of 200. That gets you to the 40 amps, which we're seeing out there um, in the chat. And perfect. Yeah, Royal Brooks, 120%. That's what you're thinking. So you got 200 amps out there. It's 120% of that. Um, so that's what you're looking at. All right. Uh, Sir Chach, I will pass it back. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so after this second group exercise, so we will just continue with some uh, field inspection best practices. This is going to be like a summary of everything we covered uh, today. Um, so uh, we will just take a look at the major problem areas and uh, related uh, considerations for those. Um, the first thing uh, we will look at is the, the quality of installation. Uh, so one common area for co code violation is the overall installation quality. The inspector should verify if the work is done in a neat and workmanlike manner, <laughs> to be honest, and roof penetrations must be flashed or sealed. So there's there shouldn't be any unflashed or unsealed uh, penetrations, roof penetrations. And uh, the array exposed cables must be properly secured, supported, and... Uh, routed uh, to prevent physic any, any physical damage. Uh, the conduit must be correctly installed. Uh, there must be sufficient workspace and access for the operation and maintenance of the PV equipment. Uh, so th those are like uh, the kind of like uh, obvious violations uh, where you see those kind of uh, quality related violations. Uh, they, they will be easy to spot and uh, take, take uh, technically uh, verify those kind of uh, violations. And uh, second thing to, to do is actually um, to check if the installation is exactly matching the plan. So 
are the number of uh, uh, modules exactly matching the the plan uh, and uh, inspector should verify whether the PV module model number, quantity, and location, uh, array mounting system, and structural connections, type and size of the OP OCPD, disconnect, and their locations are actually matching matching the plan. If there's any weird looking uh, installation or uh, anything that's not matching the plan, that's that's going to be a major code violation. Uh, and uh, after that, actually, uh, the grounding bonding of rack modules, connection of the PV system to the grounding network system and rapid sh shutdown system also uh, need to match uh, the plan. So fire, fire is the most important. Uh, so we talked about access. Uh, 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 one of the main considerations is to check the uh, firefighters access setback line. Uh, and uh, check this is uh, within the approved plan. Uh, do uh, and uh, do you uh, have the PV systems uh, at the specific fire classification that was in the group exercise? Uh, if this is fire class C or B, uh, that needs to be listed. Uh, that's the, one of the main things to check. And I wanted to also clarify. We got questions about how steep roofs are. That. 33%, you know, rule and whether or not you need the, you know, 18 inch or 36 inch setback. I'm trying to guide people to, to measure it perpendicular to the roof plane, this 33% area, because if you're using a roof plan and you have a really steep roof plane, that 36 inches, you know, can make a huge difference. So it really should be measured perpendicular to the plane when, uh, I don't think that the building official does this, but when the designer calculates that, you know, it really should be at that plane to identify whether or not they're under or over that 33%. Yeah, thanks for uh, the addition. Um, so uh, I think this is the last thing that I uh, want to mention, labeling. Uh, so, uh, for the labeling, uh, so all conductors, cables, conduit types, sizes, uh, and markings installed uh, should be installed according to the approved plan, and the labels, should, proper labels, should be attached. Uh, and uh, that's uh, if the labeling is not properly uh, attached, that that should be, uh, uh, I mean, easy fix, but that should be noted. Uh, and uh, reported. So uh, I think this covers uh, everything up to this point. So as a key, major key takeaways, we can just uh, take a look at the key takeaways of this training. As a summary, uh, uh, the field inspection process is uh, the key to the development of a healthy and safe PV industry. Uh, the inspections verify that the installation is compliant with the building and electrical codes and fire safety requirements. Many inspection checklists exist and can help the inspection is inspectors to perform their code enforcement obligations. Um, common major code violations are in the array, inverter, grid connection, and junction boxes. Wire management is the one of the most important parts of inf inspection. Conductors that touch the roof are subject to damage, which can cause system failures or arcing fires. Electrical grounding is another important consideration for electrical inspection. Uh, fire departments should have a safe path that they can access to the roof. Uh, and then finally, pairing with the solar battery storage is likely to grow. Uh, and you may see more examples of these in the future and inspections should be uh, planned uh, to inspect the battery storage systems as well. So uh, that ends uh, my section for today. And now uh, uh, I would like to open the, the Q&A session and thank you for your attention. Perfect. Thank you so much to uh, Sirtach, Jeffrey, and Omaris. Uh, that was an awesome session. I want to address some of the questions that came in in the chat. 
Uh, the first one is a quick question for me about will handouts of this training be provided? Yes, we're gonna have a recording of the training posted. We will get the slides up and um, everyone is gonna be getting a link to that as soon as it's ready, along with your certificate of attendance. Um, so uh, the rest of them are for the experts. So let's start with this. Why do installers always use insulating piercing taps when they could have the meter pulled and do a much better bug, maybe job, and avoid issues like the failed picture showed? So, you know, why contractors decide to, to install the way they do is um, probably something that makes a lot of us shake our heads uh, sometimes. And so the important thing to remember, though, is, you know, what ends up being uh, code compliant. So you can actually install these projects in a myriad of ways. Um, that are code compliant. So as a code enforcement agency, you might shake your head on why they did it a certain way. Um, but ultimately, the, the point is to just say, okay, well, you know, I, you did it this way. Is that actually code compliant? Because, you know, in some cases, if you're a contractor every, and you have a hammer, everything is a nail. And so you just do the same project the same way, regardless of what would have been more cost effective for what would have been more cost effective for the homeowner, potentially, or also could have been more cost effective for the contractor themselves. Um, and so that, you know, there's no real strong answer to that um, other than just, again, just trying to make sure you're tracking for what is compliant. Amaris, would you add to that? Yeah, I would just add, you know, I reviewed this one in-house as well when we received that photograph. And I mean, it is a UL listed, you know, splicer, if you want to call it a splicer. Um, the key thing is, as you guys have mentioned before in your presentation, is to make sure that it is installed appropriately. And when uh, the inspectors are out there inspecting these types of connections, these line taps, to make sure that the torque, like they have a torquing tool or someone has a tool that they can then check the torque spec that is installed per the manufacturer. Because sometimes, I guess, in some of those situations, it's hard to tell what actually caused it from that photograph because obviously everything was completely charred, but it looks as if that it could possibly have been just um, not installed at the right torque and those kinds of tapping elements can be pretty temperamental. So it's just making sure it's not over torqued or under torqued, uh, something to check for when you're on site. Thank you so much. Okay, this next one uh, is definitely a good one. Um, how do you inspect a three-family home roof? Uh, drone, question mark. Yeah, some don't go on the roof. Uh, a lot of communities don't have inspectors go on the roof for single-family homes either. Um, and so a lot of inspectors do it by photo. So um, they want to see attachments. They want to see the module. They want to see stickers of what the modules are. Um, a lot of folks do it that way. Um, but yeah, you could do it. Some are thinking about, you know, drones where you can have a video go up and you can actually inspect. Some are thinking about that too. Uh, you see more photos than anything. Amaris, I'm not sure if you have thoughts too on what you're seeing in Connecticut in that area. Yeah, we, we encourage remote video inspections for stuff like this too at the state RVIs for short. And we use it often at, at the state for different applications, obviously, it's at the discretion of the inspector and what they're comfortable with. But um, I recommend that each municipality, um, if you guys do um, use the assistance of remote video inspections to create some type of standard operating procedures and guidelines for your municipality that helps the installers and the contractors know what you're looking for in terms of uh, lighting, clarity, making sure they have cell service or something, but usually just doing like a Zoom call or a Teams call and either you're at right outside at the front yard or you're in your office. But the idea is to make sure that you guide them to what you want to look at and they can take the camera with them while they're on the roof. They can, you know, check connections for you if you have any questions until the inspector is satisfied. That would be our, our recommendation or any other method that you guys feel comfortable with. And I encourage folks to have the chat window open too, because um, we're getting some great uh, commentary from other folks that have dealt with similar issues, uh, especially around the line side taps. So I encourage folks using the chat 
liberally to also help answer the question. Because to be honest, this you know inspection um, is difficult. The technology is rapidly changing, and so you all are the front line to understand. You know, and try. You're required to go out there and navigate this stuff, right? So um, it's important. We're learning. We can learn from you just as you might learn something from us. Uh, the other thing I was going to say, too, is that some inspectors require, you know, to have the contractor um, get their professional engineer to sign a letter or the company to attest that they have complied with the code um, and absolve the inspector of the obligation to look at that um, stuff on the roof such that uh, if something happens, you know, it just further clarifies that that liability is with the contractor. So there's another way uh, to do that, too. But again, folks, please do keep putting stuff in the chat. We've been uh, yeah, it's been very valuable. Comments. Mark Duty made a really good point about drones. That 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 actually is a really good point. Um, in Connecticut, uh, I hope I'm not mis misspeaking here, but I know at my previous firm, I, I learned about this. You require is required to have a license to fly a drone, just because of reasons like like Mark mentioned, you know, air airports, but also privacy. There's a lot of kind of privacy issues and making sure it's considered trespassing if you're you know, flying a drone over somebody's property. So there are licenses that are required. I think they're pretty cheap and easy to get, but it's just to make sure that you're following certain guidelines. Okay, perfect. Um, just a couple more questions from the chat and then anyone else who has questions can uh, raise their hand and we'll call on you in a moment here. Uh, the next one is for line side taps, does the service entrance conductors need to, I guess, do the service entrance conductors need to be resized? Need to be resized. Um, I don't, yeah, I, maybe we're looking at a particular picture or one of our examples from above. Um, yeah, if the person who wrote that question wants to raise their hand, I believe I can unmute you and uh, you could clarify. Okay, awesome. Let's see that. All right, Anthony, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Seems it sounds very quiet. If you could get a little closer to the mic, maybe. What about now? Oh, oh. I'm sorry, we can barely hear you. You can maybe just clarify in the chat too, if that works, yeah. and then we'll maybe back to that. Some okay. folks are interpreting your question though in the chat. Um, so there's some, some back and forth there, but maybe we can, yeah, let's uh, go back and forth on that one a little. Okay, um, the next question is, how would the setback be affected by solar shingles? That is a good question, and I can't recall offhand so the difference looking, there. Yeah, I was looking at that earlier, too, and I don't believe, um, depending on how the, the, in the IRC, at least, I haven't looked at it from the IBC side of things, but I think the setbacks do still apply because the setbacks and the roof access pathways are its own section and all photovoltaic systems need to comply with the entire section. So, so BIPV systems are its own obviously integrated system. The only Connecticut specific thing that we do require is that there is an additional placard or a sign on the side of the house with the Maltese symbol for firefighters because we, they want to make sure these shingles look like regular shingles, right? And the last thing you want is for a firefighter to climb on the roof, not knowing that there is a live electrical system on the roof. Um, so that Maltese symbols alerts them to the fact that there are PV systems on the roof so they can maintain the pathways and make sure that they set their set in that distances. But um, from my understanding is, yeah, the setbacks still apply. So they still need to vent that roof. Okay, perfect. And then last question before we get to Walter, I see his hand is up. Anyone else can raise their hand also. Um, so this says label with a backup generator, how, what should signage say? So we're talking about when you have 
a backup generator being like a diesel generator. We're not talking about a backup energy storage system here. Uh, Maybe that's, yeah, more so speaking out loud, <laughs> that individual asking the question. But labeling requirements actually are and can vary by jurisdiction, but there are some basic requirements here. So there is no, in the code, there isn't a hard and fast rule for what your labels must say, but there are examples of what to, to include. Um, more or less, as, you know, as shown here, so. Uh, okay, great. And so anyone who has other questions or who wants to clarify one of the questions from earlier, you can go on the reactions on the bottom sort of right hand uh, interface, click that and then click raise hand. So I'm gonna uh, unmute Walter and let him ask his question. Uh, so Walter, go ahead. You are muted, but we are asking you to unmute here. Okay, maybe Walter needs a minute. Anyone else wanna ask a question or just feel free to raise your hand with the reactions? Uh, Steve has a question in the chat here. Um, 324.6.1, last sentence says, pathways shall be located in areas with minimal obstructions, such as vent pipes, conduit, or mechanical equipment. Does that mean conduits and vents are fine in the pathways? No, I mean, it says vent pipes is one of the listed items. Now, remember it says minimal, so we can't avoid all obstructions, right? Especially on an existing roof. So the idea is to provide the best possible route with the least amount of obstructions for firefighter access. Yeah, I feel like the wording of that is confusing. The such as, I think is referring to the obstructions, not the pathways. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Walter, I'll give you one last chance for if you're able to unmute and ask your question. Seems like we're, we're wrapping up here. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Um, once again, a huge thank you to our panelists, Sir Taj, Jeffrey, and Omeris. Um, thank you so much to everyone who joined us today, and especially thank you to the people who participated and actively answered questions in the chat and asked questions in the chat. That makes a difference. That's how you really learn. So, uh, and a big thank you to Danny and Sarah from um, Soul Smart. We appreciate your participation in this, and uh, you'll be hearing from me soon with slides and a recording. So, thank you so much to everyone. We'll see you around. Thanks, all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.